everyone, and welcome back to the Neurodiverging Podcast. I'm Danielle Sullivan, and I am your host. I am so pleased you're here with us today. Thank you for taking the time. Today, we'll be talking to Amanda Diekman about her experience with autism diagnosis as an adult and her experience raising her neurodivergent family, particularly a son with the PDA profile of autism. I know that's a topic that many of you have requested, so I'm glad we can get that going for you today. Before we get to that, I just want to thank my patrons for supporting this podcast. The podcast runs on patron donations. If you're interested, please check out patreon.com slash neurodiverging, where you can find out more about how to pledge to the neurodiverging podcast to keep us running and keep us in business and also get some very excellent behind the scenes perks. <laughs> the pledges start at just a dollar a month. The Patreon again is patreon.com slash neurodiverging. I really appreciate you looking into it. And a very quick plug for the website at neurodivergent.com. You can find there are articles about neurodivergent issues, full professional transcriptions of the podcast, and a list of upcoming events that I'm hosting, the vast majority of which are free or low cost. We really work hard to keep those educational events accessible. I do monthly webinars, I host support groups, and I teach classes, so please come join us. The link is in the description below. It's neurodivergent.com slash upcoming events. Now, let me tell you about our guest. Amanda Diekman is an ordained Presbyterian pastor, spiritual director, and autistic contemplative, which is my favorite phrase. She lives with her husband and three boys in the North Street community, an intentional residential community with neighbors of all abilities in Durham, North Carolina. You can find her writing at amandadiekman.net, link down in the show notes below, and on Instagram at simple.soulful.amanda. I know you will love this interview. I had such a great time learning everything from Amanda. So enjoy. Welcome to Neurodivergent Podcast, Amanda. I'm so happy you're here today. How are you Thank doing? You. I am great. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. Um, Amanda works in low demand parenting, which is like my favorite <laughs> approach to parenting, though I think the terminology you use is not something I was familiar with before we, we started talking, um, but sounds very similar to what we do in our household. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it today. Um, so you're a late identified autistic. You work in PDA, which we'll talk about a lot. And you have two kiddos. Is that right? I have three. Three. Wow. Congratulations. Uh, two is enough for me, but that's <laughs> hopefully a happy, busy household. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those are true words for us. We are we are happy, we are busy, wild, and yes. um, and a, a lot of spontaneous joy. Yes, that sounds beautiful. That's sounds a lot like our house too, which is great. So I know you are a late identified autistic, right? And I was wondering if you could tell. We've had several guests, and I have a lot of coaches, also women and queer folks who are identified after their kiddos were identified, and many of us were identified pretty late in our 30s, 40s and up. Um, and as one of them, I'd love to hear your story about that. I know it, it really helps listeners um, feel like they're not alone when we're all identified so late and missed over. So what was it like for you to be identified, you know, later in life as an adult? And how did you come to that identification? Well, it's helped me so much to hear other people's stories. It's really an honor to share mine because the, the way through is often for me through stories and through storytelling. Um, and in some ways the, the beginning for me is the stories I told myself when I was a kid about who I was and how I learned to survive in the world. I was a, um, a very bright, a very opinionated and, um, eventually a very perfectionist child. One of the ways that I learned to cope with the world was by getting everything right. Mm -hmm. And I believed that if I got everything right, then I could rest and then I could be uh, a part of a part of the world. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, I, I struggled with that narrative for all of my growing up years and used it, channeled it into schoolwork and into friendships. I worked so hard and the effort I think is one of the things that I look back on and I see just how hard I was working to do the things that the world was taking for granted and mm -hmm. no one saw just how much churning was happening inside of me to, to show up and, and be missed basically. Mm -hmm. When I, when I first heard about autism, um, I was 
um, beginning to work with autistic adults who needed more support in social engagements. And mm -hmm. I became a friend to a lot of people who needed a little bit of hand holding. And I felt so comfortable and alive and myself in those settings. Mm -hmm. And I just attributed it to like, oh my gosh, what a great gift these adults have to offer to the world. These are such gifted people who are being ignored and wow, how wonderful it is that I get to be in their presence. And now again, when I look back, I realize, oh, something was coming to life in me because I was doing a me too, me too, me too kind yeah. of moment. Um, and, and I didn't know it then. And eventually I became chair of the board of this organization that was pairing up um, people for pizza and dance parties and all kinds of things. And again, I didn't know throughout my eight years of chairing the board, I didn't know that mm -hmm. I was autistic. And um, so it was only when I began investigating for my son, mm -hmm. um, who is seven, that I did my own deep dive into autism. And I think this is familiar for a lot of people's stories that it, I can now see I was completely autistic in the way that I learned about autism <laughs> yeah. because I couldn't get enough. I mm -hmm. read and I read and I read. It was like my brain was spinning at a faster pace than it had in years mm -hmm. and probably actually was on a brain level. And I had to do a lot of digging and a lot of work because my son's profile didn't fit the standard. And so, you know, what I, what I was looking at, I was like, I'm sure that this fits, but I, I have to deconstruct everything if I'm going to mm -hmm. understand the way that he fits. And in the process, I discovered that I fit. I think if I'd had a child with a more classic presentation of autism, mm -hmm. I might have been missed as well, because yeah. it was only when I looked at, okay, well, what's the actual mechanism? Not are they lining things up, but why are you lining things up? What's mm -hmm. that about? that I could see, oh, so when I went into my mom's office and compulsively uh, organized all of her paper clips into tiny compartments, I was doing the same. I was making sense yeah. of the world and, and fulfilling a need that I had. So when I was 38, I had my own diagnostic experience just three months after my seven-year-old went through his. Yeah. His experience was at Duke Autism Center, very official, very clinical, cold, very anxiety producing for me. Mm. And mine was over Zoom in my, my room, in my rocking chair with my husband by my side with an autistic ADHD woman who was as brilliant and professional as those Duke autism people, but mm -hmm. a completely different approach. Yeah. She believed me from the start. Um, she helped me retrace my journey. She opened up things that I'd never considered before. hadn't realized so much about how my brain works until mm -hmm. she started asking me just the right questions. And it unleashed so much self-awareness. It's been a year since then and, and truly one of the most amazing years of my life to know who I am, to finally belong Mm -hmm. to the right group, I think I, I finally stopped working so hard. Yeah. And there is a settling inside of me as I now say, Ooh, I don't want to be that person, the person I wanted to be for 37 years. Yeah. I, I want to be this person. Mm -hmm. And, um, and now I, I, I feel like in another 30 years, I'm going to be so much more whole than I've been ever before as this identity can sink deeper and the masks come off mm -hmm. and the insides match the outsides. That sounds a lot like my experience of just, as you say, settling into it, that it can be so much stress we're put under, we put ourselves under and so much pressure to conform to neurotypical standards or the greater society. And then once you have that group identification it's like oh I'm allowed to just be and that I really love that in 30 years because I also look forward to in another 10 years I'll be even more of me right even like more saturated Danielle-ness so, yes <laughs> saturated that's yeah. a great word yeah yes thanks <laughs> there was a lot of grieving for me in the process mm -hmm. of I don't want to skip over that yeah. the grief was mostly for all of the years lost yeah. And all of the hiding and all of the ways that I, I ninja my personality to try to fit. And, yeah. um, 
and the loss inside of me, the loss of belonging Mm -hmm. that finally belonging unleashed this recognition that I had never belonged and, and that I'd done a lot of things that were painful to myself Mm -hmm. and to others to try to achieve something that was never possible. Mm -hmm. Um, But one thing that it also did was I realized that I've always been this person with my husband and we didn't That's know beautiful. the word for it. And <laughs> yeah, and it, he, of all people, is like, well, this is who you, th- of course, mm-hmm. this is who you are. We just have a name for it now. Yeah. He's neurotypical, mm-hmm. um, but it made me love him all the more and gave us so much gratitude for mm-hmm. our relationship from the start. I haven't hidden with him. I yeah. Hidden this part of me. Yeah, that's the ideal relationship for sure. Is finding someone you don't have to mask with. You just are with them fully. That's yeah. wonderful. I'm glad. And you there's some that. stories that you can't do that with neurotypical yeah. people. That it's not possible. And I just want to share that for us, it is. It's yes. Like, he yeah. loves me for exactly who I am and how I am, and we're not the same in mm-hmm. so many ways. We're not the same. <laughs> we have so much communicating. Like when you said that. I heard, mm-hmm. but did you mean, and, <laughs> but it just makes it stronger for the level of work we put in mm-hmm. to the relationship. Yeah, that is good to hear. I think a lot of women who are identified later do really worry about how their partners and how their families, and even sometimes how their children will react to having this new name for who you've always been. And that, um, it can be really scary and a little bit ostracizing to feel like you can't, you know, tell these people that you love a really important thing about you. So Mm -hmm. it is really good to hear positive stories of relationships maintaining, even, even with diagnoses and new identifications and everything. (laughs) Yeah. Glad to share it. I'm glad it's been my truth. Yes, me too. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate your honesty. And you've mentioned that you, um, really started to pursue this when you were looking at your kiddos identification or potential identification. Had you been considering that he might be neurodivergent for a long time at that point, or what were you facing um, as a parent or, or what was your daily life like that made you want to pursue identification? Yeah. yeah. I, so I have three kids, three boys, and my oldest, uh, they're all neurodivergent. And then I am. So I didn't have a model to base on to say, oh, well, this is different because mm-hmm. you're not like so and so. They were all like me mm-hmm. and like each other, <laughs> although there couldn't be more different, but mm-hmm. nobody, nobody fit the mold. So it was really my oldest when he was two, and people are starting to talk like oh so what's your kid like and I'm watching him begin to play with others and he joined a small in-home play group Mm -hmm. it's when I really started to notice oh he is not like the others Mm -hmm. and uh, and he was so delightfully himself Mm -hmm. that had a lot of pride in who he was and I, I wanted everyone to see his uniqueness and at the same time his struggles at home were so outside the realm of normal Mm -hmm. that I had a hard time finding anyone who I could connect with. Oh, your parenting is like my parenting. Mm -hmm. Um, He he would change clothes 15 times a day and it would take hours to find any piece of clothing that he Mm -hmm. could tolerate. And everybody said, oh, it's control. He's trying to control you. You know, you need to put boundaries on. Mm -hmm. The advice I got in those early days was so bad for me yeah. and so bad for my children. Mm-hmm. And even the gentle parenting advice that I got was, was really bad because mm-hmm. a lot of it was around mirroring and sports casting. Mm-hmm. If you're familiar mirroring where yeah. I say like, Oh, you look angry mm-hmm. and yeah. sports casting kind of like describing what they're doing. Oh, you're yeah. ripping your shirt off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And those two things were very escalating for mm-hmm. all of my children. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt so at a loss when I had um, another one come along and then another one come along. We had, we were at four, two and zero when mm-hmm. things kind of broke open yeah. for me. They were so difficult to parent in the traditional path. 
-hmm. I went to a parenting group where we were supposed to be learning like de-escalation techniques. And she, the teacher described sitting down on the floor next to them, gazing away from them, relaxing Mm -hmm. her shoulders, breathing and letting them kind of calm down and then come climb into her lap. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, but they're punching me. Yeah. So how, how does that work? (laughs) She She was like, Ooh, you're outside the bounds of what I've been trained for. And, and that's just always the way it was yeah. Every, everywhere I went, the things that I was experiencing were outside the bounds of what mm-hmm. people were prepared for, but nobody said autism. Mm-hmm. Um, it was always parenting yeah. and usually attachment. Mm-hmm. Oh, there must be something in the attachment. And I knew I was an attached parent. I I knew that they trusted me and loved Mm -hmm. me and that that was part of why I was seeing what I was seeing. Yeah. Um, So for years, I blamed myself Mm -hmm. because it was the only, because everyone else blamed me. Yeah. And it was the only thing that I could think of that, well, if I just parented differently, somehow I could parent my way out of this. Mm -hmm. And at, at my second son's two-year-old appointment, when you check off the boxes, that's an early screener for autism. Yeah. I wanted to chase her into the hall and say, these aren't the right questions. I have boxes. I have mm-hmm. boxes to check. <laughs> You're not asking me the right question. Yeah. But I didn't because mm-hmm. um, something held me back. I think something around ableism, mm-hmm. like I didn't want to be identified. I didn't want to, to check boxes, even mm-hmm. though I knew that we did. And also I think the institution, it was a moment when the institution could have seen that, Mm -hmm. could have asked different questions and we could have gotten support and the questions were wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is something that, that drives me now is to give examples that people can relate to that, that were not the questions that they asked then, Mm -hmm. but to ask now, you know, does this feel outside the bounds to you? Mm -hmm. I feel like we would catch so many more people just by letting parents say, my flags are up. Something's yeah. going on here. Yeah. Um, because that was happening for me. Mm-hmm. When we started with occupational therapy, I got some bad advice. I got, I said, are you sure we shouldn't check for autism? Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, he makes eye contact. You know what I'm going to say? He's yeah. so social. <laughs> he has so much empathy. It yeah. couldn't be that. hmm And so that was another opportunity that slid by that was around four. Mm -hmm. And then it it was really me. There was a voice inside of me that said, autism, autism, autism. You Mm -hmm. have to look into this. You have to understand that. And I'm, if I didn't see him and identify him, there's no one in the world that would have. Mm -hmm. And even mm-hmm. in his official diagnosis, I'm so glad I knew as much as I did because it took me bringing up the right examples mm-hmm. to ensure that they would even see, even at you know Duke Autism Center, that they would be able to see my son's presentation and mm-hmm. see his, his autistic brain yeah. within it. So that happened when, when he was, actually, I think he was six then mm-hmm. and um, is now seven. So mm-hmm. it's still early compared to 38. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But when a part of me knew at two, Mm -hmm. um, I would have really benefited from somebody coming alongside and giving me different parenting advice and giving me a name and giving me community when I had four, two and zero, that's when I needed it. What came was, yeah, five years too late for me. Yeah. I think your point about how uh, parents and often mothers are blamed for our children's anything <laughs> um, is, is a really interesting and important one because historically people used to believe that autism was because mothers were too cold, right? We were too unattached. We were too away from our children. And now there's still this tendency to be like, well, your child's behavior is because you are not mothering the right way. And it's like, well, <laughs> there are better and worse ways to parent. Sure. But generally you know, the parent is doing the best, the kid is doing the best and putting the pressure on the family instead of offering support to the family is not going to help anything. I'm also just really interested to hear your story about really having to push them to see the right pieces of his personality and his presentation um, is really similar to 
my experience with my son, who is, I would say, more typically autistic. They did diagnose, but I really had to put a lot of pressure and record the right videos to submit as evidence and, you know, write down the right things because he made eye contact, like you said, and he, um, he didn't point, he didn't smile, he lined things up and he is a small white child, boy, boy presenting child. So like he fits a lot of those institutionalized criteria of autism, but he, you know, he smiled, he laughs, he makes terrible jokes all the time, which are my favorite. Um, he, uh, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is the emotional regulation piece and the just thinking differently. The cognitive style is different. If we hadn't pushed, I really don't know if they would have diagnosed and I, and, and then we would have been denied services that were actually really helpful for us. It's, really frustrating as parents when we have these experts who are supposed to be supporting us and supporting our families we have to take that much on ourselves and do all this background research like we're not medical researchers <laughs> uh, you know but so many of us are now experts because how many books have you read about yeah. <laughs> this is because probably you know I, I've read at least 30 and maybe yeah. more so yeah yeah so. Yes, I, I agree with that. And what I went into the process really mm. wanting was for them to help me understand my child better. Yes. And I walked away thinking I didn't learn anything new mm. in this process. All yeah. I did was try to help you see what I can already see. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was so different from my identification when I was being identified by an actually autistic woman who brought so much more understanding to me. And that's something that I still hope for, for my son, is that we could do another identification process as he gets older, because mm -hmm. he's so curious about his brain. Yes. He'll, he'll ride around in the car and he'll say, tell me a story about my brain. <laughs> and I'll tell him a story of something he did and explain why it happened mm -hmm. and how, and then he'll say, and tell me about normal people's brains. <laughs> and we've deconstructed normal. I've given him a lot of alternatives. That's yeah. what he to say. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll explain what somebody else would have done mm -hmm. under those circumstances. And it usually ends up with us belly laughing about how bizarre we find neurotypical people to be and the ways that other people would have, have dealt with something that, you know, in the way that he did, but it's given us a lot of vocabulary, especially mm -hmm. because he has a less known profile of autism. Mm -hmm. It's given him that lens for himself that there's something special about his brain. He's also redheaded and blue eyed, oh which my he gosh. is very proud to tell you what is one in 1000. And mm -hmm. then he'll say, and I have an autistic brain. So <laughs> he just feels like the rarest Pokemon card in the deck. He sounds wonderful. Oh my gosh. That's so <laughs> cute. Yeah, he is. He is cute. Um, he's, he's in a season with higher support needs. Mm -hmm. So it is important for me to celebrate him because yeah. right now he's taking a lot of co-regulation energy. Yes. That is a no small task. No, so, <laughs> it is not. Yes. I have to, I'll have to really celebrate what a rare Pokemon card he is. <laughs> <laughs> He's a shiny rainbow rare uh, for any Pokemon listeners. My kids are very Minecraft oriented. So if it's a Minecraft simile, I will get it. But <laughs> we're also, we're Minecrafters that we're here too. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. how do you homeschool without, or unschool or any kind of alternative school without Minecraft? I do not know. I don't know how people used to do it, but it's wonderful. It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. I'm having a hard time convincing my son that there's 60 seconds in a minute and 60 mm -hmm. minutes in an hour, because he's so sure it should be 64, which yep. is a complete number to him yes. because of a complete stack in Minecraft. It, he's like, it, why didn't they pick 64? <laughs> because the sun and the earth did not combine to turn in that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's hard to explain those kinds of things. So you mentioned a couple of times that he has a, like an alternative profile of autism. Could we, could we kind of dig into that a little bit and talk more about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. So my son has um, a PDA profile or pathological demand avoidance mm -hmm. is what that stands for. Although I think a better description has come up that also uses the same letters, which is a pervasive drive for autonomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that flips it and puts it on in the positive and is equally true, mm -hmm. more true, really. So I self-diagnosed that for him because it is non-diagnosable in the United States, mm -hmm. although there are plenty of clinicians who are working within the framework. Um, it is still not very well known, not very well understood. And even within the autism community, it's 
little known and little recognized. Yeah. I have become very passionate about spreading the word about PDA because of how important the framework is, how significant the needs are, and also how stigmatized our child's behaviors can yes. be. Because of that, someone said that we're the, the needle in the haystack, even among autistic people who are mm. the needle in the haystack among humanity. So it's really hard. And I feel really lucky that somebody whispered the words PDA at some point on the great mm -hmm. wide internet and I picked it up and yes. went and searched it out myself mm -hmm. that, um, man, it could have been 10 more years of wondering what is going on with my child yeah. Yeah. and getting an answer to that question is so crucial. Mm -hmm. He has this internal drive to protect his own autonomy and his own control at all times mm -hmm. on a brain level. So when things threaten him, it's not conscious choice that he, he goes through to decide, okay, hmm, mom says that I have to have a purple pop because there's only a purple pop left when mm -hmm. I had in my head an orange pop. No, I am limiting his choice and mm -hmm. his choice was orange pop. It's like he flies into a panic attack yep. over this limit on his autonomy and freedom. Mm -hmm. And so us only having a purple popsicle can be meltdown inducing. Mm -hmm. It feels so out of control. It feels like we're walking on eggshells to flip, have him not flip his lid. Mm -hmm. And it felt like we have to be perfect parents. Like we cannot do anything that is outside of his realm of capacity a hundred percent of the time, or he explodes in these aggressive meltdowns that leave mm -hmm. us all reeling. And had we not found PDA, I think we would have gotten a lot of other very harmful diagnoses. Yeah to explain this behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken an accommodation framework where we want to change the way that we are with him mm -hmm. in order to give him a feeling of safety, to yeah. preserve his autonomy, mm -hmm. to give his brain the capacity to tolerate greater challenges that might uh, earlier have sent him into a meltdown and mm -hmm. now he can tolerate. And also it, we, we very much want for him to feel like he has some understanding over what's happening because he, it's frightening to him as well mm -hmm. to, to lose control over a popsicle. And he knows this, you know, we, we did size of the problem with our OT. Oh yes. Uh, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> size of the problem says, you know, small problem, small reaction. Mm -hmm. And he's the opposite, small problem, huge reaction. Mm -hmm. But his brain says, this is a big problem. And his brain doesn't know size of the problem. It, it's not, it's not on a, the thinking brain no. trying to bring that rationality into it in those times is, is not helpful. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he has a rational brain and knows afterward, whoa, there must be something wrong with me because I don't see anybody else losing it over mm -hmm. the, over the color of their popsicle. Yeah. yeah. And we wanted to nip that there's something wrong with me thinking right in the bud and instead say there's something different about you mm -hmm. and you deserve to know everything you can about that about yeah. that difference and also if I need to go to the store and get a new box pop, box popsicles right now I will yeah that's okay mm -hmm. for you today it is orange mm -hmm. and that is okay mm -hmm. that does not mean that I'm letting my child walk all over me that does not mean that you're learning that if you flip out then I'll do whatever you say no 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 that means that right in right now what you need is to preserve your autonomy mm -hmm. and control and yeah. that control says that it needs to be this color and I'm the adult I get to flex mm -hmm. I'm fine with it <laughs> you know to use the framework that we worked out that now in a proactive way, I can commit, Hey, if you always need to be able to choose the color of your popsicle, I can commit yeah. to having at least, you know, at least two boxes in the mm -hmm. fridge at all times so that you can choose mm -hmm. and giving room for myself to think ahead to the times when he's going to need, like we take two cars to all yeah. events mm -hmm. because he needs to leave. And when he needs to leave, he needs to leave now. Yeah. And that is an accommodation that we make. And thankfully we have two cars and we're able mm -hmm. to do that. 
But if we didn't, we would have to think of an alternative way to be able to get him home at any point. And it's like that through all the pieces of our lives as we think ahead of what might you need and then work with him and say, Mm -hmm. I think you might need to go home early. And so let's put all the things in place so that you can do that. Mm -hmm. And then that actually decreases his concern because he knows he's got that that plan in the bag and we can head out whenever he needs it. I don't think that any parenting coach would have led me down those roads if I hadn't discovered PDA. Mm -hmm. It was only because I knew the right name for this that I found the right kinds of accommodations. Yeah. My daughter has a lot of the PDA trait. She is not, you know, officially diagnosed because we're in the United States, but, um, we struggled a lot in her first couple of years with similar things to what you were mentioning with your son. Um, she would have these, like before she could speak, especially like three hour meltdowns over what seemed to me at the time, uh, kind of minor problems, right? Small, <laughs> small problems, small response. Um, like, you know, her shoe didn't fit the right way or she didn't want to wear her shoes or her sock was itchy or it was many shoe oriented things <laughs> at a second we, we've also so had we quite have a few many shoe, many shoe issues, many clothing issues. Like you said, changing clothes a lot, but getting decision fatigue really quickly and just shooting straight. Like you said, past the rational point and straight into fight, flight, or freeze. But usually it was the fight. It was the, the yelling, the kicking, the screaming. And I think a lot of parenting professionals would have put that into, like you said, the tantrums, trying to get control back from the parent. And they put it in this this framework where you're fighting with your child, right? You're not on the same team, but you're on two separate teams and your child's over here and you're over here and um, you have to be stronger and like take over. And there's this authoritarian kind of model that I don't love. Um, And I think I I read my butt off (laughs) trying Mm -hmm. to figure out what I could do to help her. She wasn't diagnosed with ADHD yet. Her brother was autistic and non-speaking at the time. And I was wiped out and exhausted and And I found an approach that I don't even know if he says PDA in the whole book, but it is this assumption that there's a skills gap, like that your kid is doing their best. And that if, if they're not doing what you ask it's because they can't, and you just have to take that as rote, they can't do it. So how are you as a parent, like you said, going to create flexibility and going to give them support so that they can build up the skill to eventually do it. Right. It has helped so much (laughs) with my daughter. And it's not like now working with parents when I do parent coaching, it's not exactly what I recommend for kids who are like, seem like they might be on the PDA profile, but it's very close. And it helped us so much just to like, get out of this rut of I'm a bad parent and I'm never going to do it perfectly. And to, like you were saying, help her start to plan ahead and, you know, create some resilience and create some tolerance for when things don't go right, because we can control a lot. I think a lot of parents feel like they have to create resilience by giving their kids hard things and really pushing them to do better, do better and try harder. And sometimes for some kids, maybe that works, but for my kiddos, we actually have to do fewer things so that they have more space to deal with the one hard thing. Um, and, uh, that was, like introduced, I guess, in this book, I'll put it in the show notes. I can't remember the name. I should have looked it up before, but I kind of didn't think about it. What are some of the things that you kind of do for your kiddo? Cause you talked about like planning ahead, making sure that you have an out, right? Like an escape. I loved your reference to the like small issue, small, small problem, small reaction to big problem, big reaction, because that works with my autistic kiddo, but not my ADHD year. So my older, you can say, is this a small problem or a big problem? what are you feeling? Right. And it's, and he's like, he's like, oh yeah, this is, this is a small problem. And it totally hits that rational piece of the brain with my younger. If you're like, is this a small problem or a big problem? There's no, like, she can't even respond. It's just not even her, her rational mind is like out, (laughs) you know, it's out. it'll come back when it's calmer. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to have different kids with different brains and different techniques with everybody. What are some things that you've kind of implemented in your parenting overall, or the, the way you framed your parenting to support him as best you can? Yeah, the first move that we made um, happened when he was in burnout. Mm-hmm. And so unfortunately, it wasn't until he had ground to a total halt mm-hmm. that we began to shift our parenting. But I also think that 
when a child is in burnout, Mm -hmm. the parenting that you use at that point, it's so important to get it right for the healing to happen. And it pushed us to, to the breaking point and beyond, because Mm -hmm. it turns out that the, all the framework we were using needed to break. It needed mm-hmm. to break down. It needed to crumble into pieces and then a new way could come from yeah. it. The push, push, push model did not work. No. <laughs> he was a pandemic kindergartner who- My daughter uh, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> who got left behind mm-hmm. by everything that was supposed to support him in making this big move into- you know, big kid zone. And he wanted to follow his older brother into kindergarten. He, he wanted to play on the playground. He had this picture in his head of what it was going to be. Plus his little lovely four-year-old preschool class stopped on a dime and then never. Yeah. Yeah. And he never saw those kids again. So he was working. Those are real traumas for kids that age. And he already had those. And then I pushed in, in my loving wonder, like I can be gentle with myself and also see that I pushed and pushed and pushed him to, okay, well, that setting didn't work. All right, let's try a new teacher. Okay. Now let's try this backyard preschool. Okay. Let's try another backyard preschool. Yeah. And the fourth one, he dutifully went for a month and then one day he didn't want to go. Mm-hmm. And the only framework that I had for that moment was anxiety and Mm -hmm. we can't let anxiety win. We have to show anxiety that, you know, you, you can't let it shut you down. And so I said, I love you. I'm going to help you. I Mm -hmm. picked him up and I carried him kicking and screaming Mm -hmm. to the teacher who wrapped her arms around him. Mm -hmm. And I walked away. Yeah. And that day I cried the whole entire Mm -hmm. time he was gone. Something about that did not work for me. Mm -hmm. It was like, the fullest expression of this style of parenting that says you can never let him avoid. You have to take, you know, the yeah. have to face things head on. And I went back to pick him up and the teacher said, Oh, he cried for a while, but he's yeah. fine. now." we went and got in the car yeah. and he stopped speaking to me. Yeah. He, he screamed and kicked the whole ride home. He went up into his room and that's when the burnout started. Yeah. And he didn't leave his room. He, his food restricted to only one food that he would eat. He wouldn't speak. He wouldn't do anything other than watch YouTube on his tablet for 12 mm-hmm. hours a day until yeah. from wake up to fall asleep. And we were faced with what are we going to do? Are we going to mm-hmm. take the iPad away? Are we going to use more punishment, more control? Yeah. Or does he just need another setting? You know, is it school number five? Like, how are we going to solve the problem of our child? Mm -hmm. And instead, we found PDA Mm -hmm. and I researched it like a crazy person. (laughs) And, um, and I began, and, and I also importantly tapped into my intuition, which was telling me, this is not right. This doesn't Mm -hmm. feel right. This doesn't feel good this child is hurting Mm -hmm. all these other ways of looking at him as being broken, as being disobedient, as needing me to No, none of that was right. He was in pain and he was in so deep of pain that parts of him were shutting down. And so I began a new path. And I, every time I brought him pretzels, Mm -hmm. I would set them down and walk out because I thought the least thing I can do right now is respect yeah. what he's doing. Pretzels was his only food. Um, and he would scream at me, you know, yeah. go away, all kinds of terrible, terrible words. Um, the worst things he could think of. Mm-hmm. And I would sit outside and lean my head against his door and cry because it was breaking my heart to see my six-year-old like this. And yet when he began to recover, it looked like I would set the pretzels down and he would touch my fingers as I set them down. And that was our first reconnection. Mm -hmm. And then eventually he would look up at me as I walked in Mm -hmm. and I took those moments and, and I said, we're going to, we're going to rebuild our relationship on this, on you touching my fingers when I bring you pretzels Mm -hmm. in this dark room with your iPad. So it became I, what I call it now is low demand parenting, but at the time, what it was, was meeting my child where he is. Mm -hmm. And that meant I needed to drop every single, 
imagination I had of what it looks like for a six-year-old to be thriving and instead accept this is what I have right here in front of me. I have mm -hmm. a kid who can watch YouTube, who can eat pretzels, drink water, go to the bathroom and listen to books. So we, he continued his evening routine. We were able to read him books before he fell asleep. Good. It was the only thing that we kept from like the old way. Mm -hmm. And it was because he wanted it. He wanted to snuggle. Um, he largely wanted his dad to be the one to read. And so we kept that routine for them. And from there, I realized that when I accept my child right where they are and proactively, like I wrote down that, that list of what he could do. I said, yeah. okay, here's my plan for his day. He's mm -hmm. going to wake up. He's going to watch YouTube as many hours as he wants to. He's going to eat pretzels, mm -hmm. drink water, go to the bathroom and do his bedtime routine. And that is an ideal day. Mm -hmm. And I did all the work inside of myself to be able to mean it. Yeah. So that I wasn't internally brokenhearted. I wasn't mm -hmm. crying against the door anymore. I was proud of him that he yeah. was meeting my expectations mm -hmm. and did all the things I needed to with the people in our world to say, Hey, this is what I want for him. This mm -hmm. is actively what I want. And, and he did, he healed and suddenly the world opened up a bit and yeah. he watched a YouTube video and wanted to try something that he watched yeah. instead of just watching it. Oh, these mm -hmm. kids are racing cars down the hallway and, and making them crash. I want to do it. And so we began to bring, you know, the world on the screen into real life. I followed his lead. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about low demand parenting and, and the idea behind this is really that for PDA children, the world is filled with demands, yes. so many unseen demands that we place on them. And you know, if your kid's not in burnout, then you probably still have a lot of demands wrapped around them. Yes. It was only when things came to a full halt that we were able to see just how many things we were expecting of him yeah. and, and to deconstruct all the work all the reasons that we expected that we expect you to brush your teeth because those people are supposed to brush their teeth yeah. and we expect you to say yes please because mm -hmm. that's a sign of respect and we expect you to change your clothes because clothes might smell bad or you know, all the things that we expect and when none of those things were possible anymore we had to figure out well, is this still a good life mm -hmm. and it turns out it was yeah and if that's a good life then we don't need to wrap him back up in all these expectations. Mm -hmm. And, and it turns out we didn't need to do it for our other kids either. Yeah. We weren't in burnout, but we're showing us in all these various ways that they were having difficulty mm -hmm. with the expectations that we had layered onto their lives. They're not PDAers. And so they weren't showing that in such dramatic ways and their brains aren't wired in the same way to um, resist in, in quite the same form, but it, it was important for our whole family. Mm -hmm. And when we discovered just how healing and just how beautiful and wonderful this new way was, we were like, okay, and then we're going to put words to this. We're going to give it a name. We're going to create family rules that say we can eat food wherever we want to at any time, any food, mm -hmm. anywhere, anytime. Yeah. We're going to say we get to choose how we use our screens every time. We're going to say, you know, bodily autonomy is a core value to us as a family. So no one gets touched without their consent mm -hmm. and it's my body, my choice. So mm -hmm. I get to choose what I wear all the time, every mm -hmm. time. No one can tell me differently. Mm -hmm. And we, we created all these rules around autonomy yeah. <laughs> and, and the rules ended up giving us so much freedom mm -hmm. because anybody who came into our house who was like, oh, you know, kids, you can't eat yogurt on the couch. And I would say, nope, it's family rules right here on the wall, family <laughs> rule, any food, anywhere, anytime that we began to trust it. And it became so core to who we were mm -hmm. that eventually, and of course, all this syncs up with pandemic. So we're in you know, our own little family bubble and then people start coming in. And then now eventually we're out in the world and mm -hmm. And my older son was playing with a friend who said, yeah, okay, well, you have to do it this way. And he said, no, in our family, we say that everybody gets to make, we don't force anyone. Everyone mm -hmm. makes their own choice. Yeah. That's and beautiful. Good. So he can advocate for himself a little bit now by taking this yes. out of the home. Yeah. He's beginning to bring it out into the world and, and use this framework of in our family, which I think is important that it wasn't mm -hmm. like just for you yeah. and because your brain is this way. No, this is how we're all going to be yeah. together yeah. in order so that you can thrive. And yes, it's one member of our, of our clan, but we all needed to change yeah. our way.
it's supportive of everybody, regardless of neurotype, at least for your family. And did it feel really scary initially? Or did it feel really, <laughs> was it immediately this positive, exciting? Because I mean, I, at least in my steps towards lower demands on my kiddos, um, I think I'm much better at it now. But initially it was like, will they ever eat balanced nutritional food again? Will they ever not watch TV all day? Will they ever? And you, you have a lot of this eternalized kind of like, you know, especially I think partly because of all the ways parents are blamed, especially moms again, for all the things our kids are doing wrong. It's like, is this just going to be another way society blames me for my kids not doing what they're supposed to do? How did you handle, or did you, did you experience that too? Is it just me? And, <laughs> and how did you handle that kind of it's definitely feeling. not just you. Um, I've heard <laughs> that from so many others. You know, this is one place I'm still investigating my own profile of autism. Yeah. And I think this is one place that leads me to think, ah, man, I may be a PDA or myself. Because <laughs> it just brings me to, to, to life. It brings yeah. me joy. Yeah. Uh, it felt so right mm -hmm. when like a glove fitting, when we began to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and a lot of the child parts of me actually have had healing yeah. by experiencing this freedom in this family, because the wonderful thing about this approach is that it applies to the appearance as well. Yes. So when they want to wrestle and I am not feeling like wrestling, I say, Hey, it's my body, my choice. I don't yeah. feel like wrestling mm -hmm. or like we were at the swimming pool today and I get in the pool really slowly because cold water <laughs> and cold. Cold are, do yeah. not like each other. And it feels really cold to my body. Mm -hmm. I feel things very intensely and, um, and especially cold and wet are very intense sensations for me. So they're like, we're going to push you in. I'm like, whoa, whoa, no, <laughs> I get to choose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's very important for them. It, that's, um, you know, people say like, you're the adult and you need to show them that, that you're the, mm -hmm. the adult. I don't know. There are a lot of things about me being the adult that are very important in mm -hmm. my relationship with my children. Yeah. But I, I think showing them that I'm a human yes. is more important than anything mm -hmm. that um, that me being their mom doesn't put me in some other class of existence where I don't have needs. No, I'm a human just like you. And my mm -hmm. body is sensitive, just like yours. And <laughs> I don't want to get in the pool quickly. Yeah. Um, and that them looking at me with that kind of respect, making that connection mm -hmm. of, oh yeah, she doesn't force me. So I'm not going to force her yeah. and I'm going to work around it. Mm -hmm. And they accommodate my sensitive body. And I think those are the best learning opportunities mm -hmm. for my children yeah. um, to carry with them into the world. I, I don't feel that it makes them any less respectful of me, any less loving towards me. It's more, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I deserve your care just yeah. like you deserve mine. Yeah. It sounds like I use collaborative parenting, which has elements of, of lower demands in it. Um, but it sounds like both of our styles sort of are based in basic human rights, right? So it's not about the parent in one side over here and the child over here, but rather that everybody has these sets of things that we uphold for you, that you deserve basic respect and dignity and all these, the, you know, the list. And how are we going to make it so that everybody here, regardless of age or relationship, has access to these same right it's these same basic pieces of respect so yeah which I th and I do think like you're saying that's really important for kiddos as they grow up that you want them to have a style of making decisions and understanding themselves that transfers into their adulthood um because if you're under somebody else's authority as a child for 18 years and then you're suddenly an adult it takes that can be really true it can take time to translate into well, how am I authoritative over my own body now or over my own decisions and if you teach kids like no you decide then they can carry that forward into their first relationships their first jobs their first every adulthood piece into this is how I decide what is best for me and I just I just I love that and I think it's so important <laughs> I think about that all the time yeah. that one of the most common critiques of a low demand approach is, well, what are you going to do when they get out into the world? Yeah. What about when they get their first job? Are they mm -hmm. going to tell their boss? You know, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I choose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think 
I think the opposite. I think the things that we're approaching on this very young, you know, my oldest is nine. So we're mm-hmm. not seeing some of the teenage behaviors yet, but I yeah. see how they germinate from mm-hmm. these early experiences. So my oldest doesn't like to be touched, for mm-hmm. example, but I like to hug him. I mm-hmm. want to, I want to yeah. hug him good night. Every night I want to, but that's a demand for him. And mm-hmm. the way that I approach it is when I have a need the demands are essentially stacked on top of an expectation, which mm-hmm. is stacked on top of an adult need. Mm-hmm. And when I can figure out what my need is, well, my need is to feel connected to him at that time. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, I can get that need, need met a hundred other ways that don't involve crossing his boundaries. Yes. That is true. And I also need to figure out, well, why am I choosing not to hug him? Because... I can get my needs met and still feel resentful about mm-hmm. the hug. I can still hold on to that shred of like, well, I want him to be a kid who mm-hmm. hugs his mom or yeah. play it out in the future. Well, what about, is he ever going to be able to hug anyone? You know, is yeah. he ever going to be able to have all these worry thoughts? Mm-hmm. So I, instead I flipped it around and I said, like, well, why, what am I teaching him by honoring his boundary boundaries? Mm-hmm. I'm teaching him that his safest people will never Mm -hmm. violate his body and that when he says I don't want this this doesn't feel good to me that the only appropriate answer is okay and if I from this early age insisted on hugging him anyway Mm -hmm. what would that teach him yes and how do we play that out into Mm -hmm. the future okay his safest person his mother even when he says, I don't like this, she hugs him anyway, because her needs are more important than his. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of, and I can totally see how, okay, fast forward in 10 years, it's going to be the same situations, just, just bigger. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And, and so to practice this kind of approach, it's, it's a proactive approach, but it's also a very intentional approach. You have to do your own internal work. A lot of it is on the parents, but not in the way that traditional parenting says, yes. where it's on you to like do the right song and dance. So your mm-hmm. kids are not okay. No, it's on yeah. you to figure out what are you, what's driving you here? Mm-hmm. What, why is this such an important demand in this moment? Yeah. And to truly let it go is hard work. Mm-hmm. There's a million ways to be a low demand parent where you're still resentful and angry with mm-hmm. your kids Yeah, to do it wholeheartedly where there's a positive reason behind everything and not a negative one. Well, I don't want him to melt down. Well, that's not a reason. What's yeah. the positive? What, what is it that you want them to, to yeah. learn? That's what makes it, I, I think, mm-hmm. such a good fit for our family too, is it's not just accommodating to the child. It's actually motivating the kind of people I want them to grow up and to be. Mm-hmm. And those people, I think, are going to have no problem with their first boss because they've been learning these skills from such an early age uh, yeah. uh well that's the same things I ask them when they need something of me that I don't want to give well what is it what's your need what's driving you yeah. how, how else can we get that mm-hmm. need met that doesn't violate my boundaries mm-hmm. and boy those are people who are going to be really ready for the world as it yeah. is yeah yeah they're going to be set up and I think also that this kind of parenting is really value oriented. It's like, you know, it's, it's what, what is important for you and your kids? Like you said, it's directly related to what your internal drives are and kids who grow up into adults who are in tune or in tune with their values and what they really want out of life and what they really like hope to push in, in community terms, right? Maybe it's social justice and like whatever you're doing, whatever your work, your project is of life. If you know what your values are, for when you're 20, <laughs> like how much, how much better will your life be than those of us who are figuring it out, you know, in our thirties, forties, fifties, um, you know, because we weren't given these skills of really understanding our feelings, our wants, our drives when we were younger. Mm-hmm. So I think like you, I, I often think about my kids in terms of, well, for example, we're unschoolers and in many ways that's low demand, right? That we don't sit there and make them do math worksheets and write their letters and stuff and people will be like well what if 
they get, you know, they get to college or they get to be 25 and they don't know geometry. And I'm like, they can learn it when they're 25, but they can't learn. I mean, and that you can learn what your values are and how to live them when you're 25 too, but isn't it better to know that earlier? And you can pick up like this little non-value related stuff, just this, like, you know, your algebra, your Pokemon cards, your whatever. So I could go and learn Pokemon right now, right? I didn't lose anything by not getting it when I was eight, arguably. But um, I couldn't have, I couldn't learn this, this parenting system later and still get the same results for my kiddos now. So yeah, for me, it's really about what is the underlying goal? What is, what do you want for your children? What do you want for your family? And are you parenting uh, that in a way that supports that? You know? So yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're on so schoolers much. too. Yeah. Oh, good. I I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> Have yeah, you been doing it for a long time? Um, yeah. Just just the past couple of years yeah. uh, started the pandemic, and um, it was when it, when they suddenly all came home from all their various things, and the world stopped. Yep. And I was like, all right, well, I'm doing it my way. Then it was so freeing when the world yes. stopped. It was amazing for Low us. demands. It was. <laughs> yeah. We were yeah. living a high demand life and it was mm -hmm. killing me. And mm -hmm. then everything stopped. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, then we're just going to play. Yeah. We're going to play all the time. Yeah. And it was <laughs> so good. Yeah. I mean, we went through a lot more yeah. after that, but mm -hmm. I still hold on to that first spring and what everybody did when the world stopped. Yeah. Like, man, what, really what kind of a, a moment that was for us. It was a very unique moment. Yeah. And if you're, so my youngest was in kindergarten or, or ending preschool and then was a rising kindergarten or the fall after. It sounds like maybe your kiddo was in the, your youngest was in the same place or your second was in the same place, okay. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I defy anyone to try to get a kindergartner through online schooling and not just pull pull them out and do it schooling. Like it's just sure. there was no decision. It was just the obvious choice. Yeah, oh, there was we no made way. It one week. Yeah, and... I think we made it a week too. Yeah, maybe ten days, but it wasn't very much. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I I pushed all as far as I could within that framework, and it was not very far. And nope. then like, okay, we're out. Nope. Um, <laughs> my probable pda -er would attend the morning song because she liked the song and then she would not do any of the other things and she would come back for the closing song and i was like okay we just need to <laughs> we just need to like let you go listen to your own music and not worry about this whole online kindergarten thing no no shame to the teachers they were doing their best in a very difficult time but it was not a, it was not gonna work so <laughs> Um, do you have any resources on PDA that you like would recommend for listeners who might want to learn more about it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, if you live in the United States, the PDA Society of North America is growing and Diane Gould is leads that and is doing great work bringing more awareness to all of us here who are <laughs> um, either diagnosing our kids or working on a hunch. There's a great parent coach who works at At Peace Parenting, and um, her name is Casey, and she does some pre-diagnostic work that can help people go from, I think this might be my kid, to, yeah, it definitely is, mm -hmm. and here's what it means, which is such an important part of the process yeah. for all of us in places where we can't do that with the standard mm -hmm. professionals. I think... If you're on the Instagram that you can, uh, or, or Facebook, any of the socials, you can find Christy Forbes, who does some great teaching and her Intune Pathways uh, course is really fantastic mm -hmm. for taking things deeper. Yeah. Um, she'll always take things deeper. Wherever She's you great. think yeah. it goes, <laughs> it goes deeper. <laughs> and I love, I love that about her. And, and because she's a PDA adult, she can also really help to bring more understanding of how mm -hmm. this, how this little brain is working and calm those adult fears that say, well, what is this going to look like in an adult? Yeah. Um, and she's like, well, I'll show you. Here um, I am. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 
and as you know, the same has been true for autism for so long, but we just always look at the kids and then we, we aren't imagining, well, what is this going to look like in an adult? And we have plenty of examples. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really grateful for PDA adults in this season when mm -hmm. there's still too little information and yeah. too little understanding. Um, I think the best experts are always the people with lived experience. And so that's where I would recommend that families turn first yeah. is people with lived experience. Yeah. And then secondarily to some of these um, rising leaders who mm -hmm. are able to translate that information. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'll put links to all those folks in the show notes below. So please go check them out. Thank you for sharing those. And did you wanna talk about your parenting course? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> you know, for people who are sensing that low demand parenting may be a fit, and I would say especially for parents of PDAers, mm -hmm. where it's not like, is it a fit or not? It's pretty much the way yeah. that we can accommodate our PDA children, and it's going to look different for every family. It's it's not like a set of rules to follow. Mm -hmm. It's a process for determining what it looks like to, to begin to see with the eyes of a low demand parent. So when I began this parenting method, it didn't have a name, it didn't exist. And I decided, well, I'm just going to write it down and, and kind of help explain what can feel sort of mysterious. Like, well, how do you, if, if we've always insisted that we eat dinner at the table, but our kid never does. They're, you know, they're always screaming and, and eating under a blanket, but we, every day we insist that they come to the table. How do you go from that to something else? And so that's what this course will do. It will help you begin to see all of the things, um, all of the demands that are in your life. Cause that's really step one is just to see what's there. Yeah. And, um, and I love to take a demand, like put on your shoes and break it down into all the tiny demands. Cause yeah. I could list off like 30 demands embedded yep. in on your shoes. <laughs> Once you start and thinking about it, it's like really overwhelming how much we're all asked to do every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can be. It's also really helped me when I get stuck on something, mm -hmm. I just break it down and I look yeah. at all the embedded demands because oftentimes I can change one of those tiny demands and still get the thing done. Yeah. But I do it different. Mm -hmm. And because it was really, you know, this, this piece that was hard, not the end result. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for our kids. They may be able to put their shoes on. They just need to do it when they arrive at their destination and not beforehand. So it's a matter of bringing the shoes along and putting them on in the car. That may be the key. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been really helpful for us, for example. <laughs> <laughs> Or it may be the getting up and walking over to the shoe bin that's hard. Mm -hmm. It may be that it's the adult bringing the shoes to the kid, then they can put them on by themselves. Mm -hmm. Or it may, it may be the putting them on that's hard. And mm -hmm. it's really the adult putting them on wherever that happens. They just can't put them on for themselves. So the first step is seeing. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's, it's really a matter of discerning why this matters at all. Because mm -hmm. so many demands, the easiest ones to drop are the ones that you're like, well, good parents do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> if, yep. you, if that's your why you can drop it that's not good enough yeah <laughs> you don't have to do it <laughs> yeah you are already a good parent mm -hmm. full stop so you get to drop that demand without a lot of heartache mm -hmm. the harder ones are well this is how I believe people are meant to be yeah. and okay well, why do you believe that and that's mm -hmm. that's the heart work where mm -hmm. you begin to dig down deeper and then the great thing is this all happens in communication with your child. So the third step is to get to know what your kid is thinking. Well, what's hard about this process? And kids have a lot to say. Yes, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have a lot to tell us. It may be with words or like with my kid, a lot of it has to do with behavior. Mm -hmm. If, if I ask him a certain, if I open up a topic and he, he says, shut up, I think, Ooh, that's meaningful communication that this is a problem. Uh, and this is probably a place for me to drop. Yeah. Or if I pause his iPad for us to talk and then he presses play again, like, oh, okay, that's mm -hmm. good communication that he's done talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so having meaningful communication with your child, it may not look like a calm, 
across the table chit chat the way mm-hmm. that you might be imagining, but it's communication all the same. Yes. And that back and forth communication yields so much information about what our kids need and what's mm-hmm. tricky for them yeah. so that we can begin to drop. And then, you know, after all of that is when the dropping happens. So you're armed with so much information about why it matters and what's going on with your kid. And then you can begin to strategically drop demands, to build structure around mm-hmm. those drop demands and then build in either routine or novelty, depending on what your kid needs. PDAers often need a lot of novelty, but a lot of children need a lot of routine. So it's really a matter of balancing those two needs and um, creating a family routine around it. So if that's the kind of process that people are looking for, then that's what you'll find in the course. And the great thing about it is it's super practical. These are things that are happening every single day. <laughs> we, we eat every single day. We dress ourselves every single day. We brush our teeth, some of us, every single day. <laughs> and so there's so many opportunities to practice dropping demands. It's like a game. It can be, okay, well, brushing teeth was hard yesterday, but we didn't do it while singing. Maybe yeah. if we try singing, maybe it's Maybe it's too serious if we yeah. try to make it silly. Maybe it, that it's the demand that it be done in, you know, in a serious mm-hmm. way or silently mm-hmm. or laying in bed. We brush teeth laying in bed because mm-hmm. the demand of going into the bathroom is way too much, but the t- tooth brushing is not a problem. Mm-hmm. It's spitting in the sink. That's the yeah. problem. <laughs> so we spit into a cup. It just, there's so many demands that you can drop mm-hmm. once you figure out how to look at the world through this, um, through this lens. And so this course holds your hand as you begin to do that and gives a framework for how to do it, not just once or twice, but how to build a lifestyle around it that can feel really fulfilling and really positive. And especially in a world that says parents are supposed to have high expectations for their kids. Mm -hmm. I think we need to know that we're not alone in this. And so I think the course also gives you a sense of community that there's at least one other mom out there who's doing these crazy things alongside you and (laughs) finding a lot of joy in it. Thank you so much. So I'll put a link to that course in the show notes below too. So please go check it out. And also Amanda's Instagram is down there and she posts really good stuff. So go follow her. And thank you so much for being here with us today. I really appreciate all the detailed information you shared and how much you gave about your own life and your family's life, because I think it'll help a lot of folks who are listening to this. So thank you so much. It's an honor. I'm glad to be a part of your community. Thank Thank you for including me. Thank you so much for joining us on the Neurodivergent Podcast today. Please check out the links below and in the show notes for more information on Amanda and her work. We also have transcription available for folks who would like it at neurodiverging.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider putting some money in the pot to support it through Ko-fi, PayPal, or the Patreon. Links are all below. I look forward to seeing you again in the next podcast. Please remember, we are all in this together. <laughs>